given the amount of time you spent in falling water, if you had to go back in time when Frank Lloyd Wright was designing the house, is there anything that you would advise him to tweak? You know, that's a, that's a tough question because I admire the house so much. Um, I There's not much about it that I dislike. I mean, it could be, I think because I'm a historian, I see it in the context of its time. And although where I work in the house is in the ser- former servants' quarters, I would say those hallways could be a little wider because we're sh- schlepping things in and out all of the time. And right now I'm moving things out of my office and tripping and, and things of that sort. But that's about it. It's, a, it's really, it's a wonderful house. It's, I, I wouldn't say it's perfect for everyone, but for what for the family for whom it was designed and, and what the program was, I think it's pretty close to perfect. I'm Tim O'Brien. In this episode of the Shaping Opinion podcast, we are joined by Linda Wagoner. She was the director of Falling Water from 1996 until she retired in April 2018. Today we're going to focus on the story of what's been described as one of the most famous houses in America, designed by one of the greatest architects in American history. Frank Lloyd Wright and his masterpiece, Falling Water. The premise of our podcast is simple. We talk about the people, events, and things that have shaped the way we think. In this episode, we'll learn from Linda what makes this house so special and why what started here has become integrated into the way we think about house and home to this day. Frank Lloyd Wright was born right after the American Civil War in Wisconsin. He started his career in 1887 and was a well-known architect well into the 20th century. He was the originator of the organic approach to modern architectural design and construction. By 1934, however, many considered him past his prime. He was in his late 60s, in his third marriage, and there wasn't much demand for new commissions. The Kaufman family owned a highly successful department store company in Pittsburgh. They had a weekend retreat at Bear Run, about 90 miles away, where the family enjoyed the beauty of nature. One of the key features of the property was the Bear Run Waterfalls. The family wanted to build a new house there. In 1934, the Kaufmans and Frank Lloyd Wright came together to create an architectural masterpiece. One of the foremost experts on falling water is Linda Wagner, and you can learn more about her impressive background in our show notes. This is our conversation. You've spent so much time at Falling Water. Can you describe how it all started for you? So I was a teenager, and I uh, about 17 years old, and uh, friends of my parents, mainly my mother's friend, Bernadine Hagen, owned the other Frank Lloyd Wright house nearby. And the house had been open for one year, and they were surprised at how many people really wanted to come see it. They never expected that kind of reception, and they were having difficulty getting guides. Bernadine called my mother and she, I was interested in art and architecture. I didn't know exactly where I was going to go in my career. She suggested I come and, and, and apply for a job or get a, an interview. But I remember walking down from the parking lot that first day when I was interviewing and coming around the bend and seeing the house for the first time. And I had this really strange sort of in your gut visceral experience that my life had just changed. And it had. And I, so I worked there through high school and then college and worked in other venues. Um, I became an art historian and was able to come back with, as the first curator in 1985. I came in as a curatorial consultant. And then in 86, I was given a full-time job and made administrator of the site. Do you have to say why you've stayed here so long? Why would you say that is? I, th- I think because it's, the house doesn't bore me. At all. I, have, I, I grew up in the area. I love this part of the world to begin with. And for the couple of years that I lived outside of this area, I just missed the mountains. I, I, I grew up in the midst of, of, of nature, so it's very important to me. And it also, so the house combines my loves of nature and of architecture, and I'm, it doesn't bore me. 
Even today, I, I walk around the house and I see things that I hadn't seen before. It's, it's, I think that's the, the test of a, of a true masterpiece, is that it does not ever bore you. Long before Falling Water, Frank Lloyd Wright was famous. He was somewhat of a rebel, mm -hmm. not only in architecture, mm -hmm. but also in his personal life, mm -hmm. wasn't he? Yeah, he was. And, and Falling Water comes at a time in his career when, at the career of any architect, when he was thought of as being pretty much washed up. He had not done uh, many projects in the previous previous decade. Um, I think only maybe 10, uh, maybe fewer than that, actually. And so when when this project came to him, for him, it was a chance to reestablish himself as a player in the world of architecture. His career had been ellipsed by the whole international movement. Um, he was seen as a 19th century architect rather than a 20th century architect. For both Kaufman and for Wright, it was a chance to make a, a, a big statement, and it did exactly that for both of them. He was described as the father of organic architecture. Could you explain what organic architecture is and his role in yeah. creating it? Yeah. Uh, well, well, the concept of organic architecture really comes out of the, the Gothic period and an interest in nature that reestablishes its, its, itself in the uh, late 19th century as Art Nouveau. But it's a, a, it's a concept that all of the parts live harmoniously to create the whole. And nature is often the source that organic architects turn to because there is no better expression of harmony of parts to, to the whole than uh, a plant. It, it's designed, a, a plant grows where the conditions are right. It reflects the environment. Wright saw that principle as essential in architecture. He also, as opposed to the international style architects or the modernist architects, did not see homes or houses as places for, well, the, a house was not to be a machine, which is, um, a machine for living is what what uh, what it was called by some of the modernists. He thought a house was a place for living, and that it had a spiritual component as well. Uh, it was a place for a family to grow, for um, for a child to grow up, and that was very important to him. Connecting people with the outside. I mean, he really made outdoor living, which has become so popular in America. He was the first person that really thought of, you know, you can eat outside, you can do all of these things where you're, where the outdoors, the terraces are an extension of the house itself. One of the things you mentioned was the Kaufman family. They were the ones that actually commissioned Frank Lloyd mm -hmm. Wright to do this. And it was Edgar Kaufman Jr. who discovered Frank Lloyd Wright in 1934, when Frank Lloyd Wright was around 67 years old. Yeah. Can you say what the attraction was there? What attracted the Kaufmans to Frank Lloyd Wright? Well, the Kaufmans already knew about Wright. Edgar Kaufman had contacted Wright about the possible uh, design of a planetarium in Pittsburgh, but it, that project never went anywhere. Then Edgar Kaufman Jr. was in Europe studying painting early 30s when he was brought home because of the rise of Nazism. He was in Austria. I think he was, he had lived a rather bohemian life in Europe as a painter, and he comes back to Pittsburgh, uh, and is sort of at loose, loose ends. He, he then goes to New York, and um, still floating around not knowing exactly what he's going to do, when a friend of his gives him a copy of Frank Lloyd Wright's autobiography, which had been recently published. This was a way for Wright to bring in some money, because he'd had no commissions, and it was still during the Depression. And like a, a lot of people who read the autobiography who were interested in architecture and in art, Edgar Kaufman said it was like water entering dry land. And he want, talked to his parents about going to study with Wright. And I think his parents felt that was a good idea, given he was otherwise uh, not doing much. And that's, that's how the whole thing began. Now Wright, like any, any good architect, could smell a potential client from miles away. He knew Kaufman because he'd had that previous communication with him and knew he was a very wealthy man and invited Mr. and Mrs. Kaufman out to Taliesin to see how well young Edgar was doing there. And from that visit, um, he uh, Wright generated money to, to build the model for Broadacre City, his, his concept of, of the decentralization of, of cities in America. Also got a, a commission for um, the redesign of the interior of Kaufman's office at the department store and the commission for falling water. Frank Lloyd Wright was considered 
ahead of his time. And when you go through Falling Water, you see that. Uh, I guess the question there is, was he ahead of his time or did he define the times? Um, You know, it's hard to say that he defined the times um, because his works are so specific because of that whole concept of organic architecture where buildings are related to to the setting and each program, each client, everyone is an individual and so you're going to end up with a different design. It was hard for him to create a style that was accepted. There were elements of what he did that were adopted by other architects. Um, but to say there's a right style, like there's a Le Corbusier style or Mies style, is is a difficult thing to do. Uh, some of his apprentices, of course, uh, imitated his work, but generally, in, in terms of his impact on the on the rest of architecture, it's it's mainly the principles that he espoused that are that are important. But there are things that that he that he did like. Um, uh, continuity between the interior and the exterior of a building where you can open up doors and windows and just feel like it's all part of one, that blurring of, of interior and exterior space. So those kinds of things. And other elements that, that we see still lasting today, the exterior building material is carried through to become the interior material. That was not typically done. You had brick or stone on the outside and plaster on the inside or wood. So those kinds of things, that continuity of material as the, as the interior passes through the glass to become the exterior, uh, that right um, certainly began. Uh, and he also created the open plan, which we all use today. He, he once said, uh, we live in boxes inside of boxes, and he wanted to destroy the box. And that may be his biggest contribution. And to attack the box, he did it at its strongest point, which is the corner. And so the corners disappear in Falling Water and and his other houses. I love that about the corners in Falling Water. And you see it in photos uh, very vividly when you look at the corner where the two pieces of glass connect Mm -hmm. and there's nothing in between. So when you step back, you don't even see the glass. You just see the outside. It's an uncanny feeling, you know, because you're expecting something there. That's logical that there would be a vertical a mullion or something uh, there, because traditionally windows were part of the structure of a house. But Wright designed them, and and he wasn't the first to do that, certainly. But designed brought all of the interior piers on the inside of the house, so the windows. The house could stand without windows; it would they're not necessary for anything. Let's imagine for a second we're going to take a tour mm-hmm. of Falling Water. Mm-hmm. How would you describe walking through the house right now? What would what would people see? Well, I, I would not. Um, I wouldn't start inside the house. I think it's that walk down to the house, where you're aware of the woods and you hear the stream and you hear the water, and then you come around a bend, and suddenly the house appears. And it's not the view of the house that you expected. You expect that view with the waterfall. Instead, you're seeing another part of the house which feels very different than than the southwest elevation. Next, you cross a bridge. And that bridge is really important because that separates you from the outside. That's your moat almost, you know, uh, the drawbridge that comes down almost. Uh, and and you, you're entering into the realm of the family's life there. Then you're trying to figure out, how do I get into the building? Because the doorway isn't easily found. It's, uh, it's just a, a slip between two stone walls and it's dark and, uh, and you're looking uh, how to cut, get into the house. It's almost like going into a cave because these two uh, stone walls are dark and then you enter and it's compact, confining, and you're tur- and he turns you. It's like walking through the woods almost. He turns you, you go up a few steps and you enter the living room on the diagonal and it just opens up for you. So you have this sense of compression and then we say release as you enter the living room. And by entering at the diagonal of a room rather than uh, in the center of a room, uh, a room seems much larger than it actually is. It's an, actually an old English garden technique of, of making spaces seem, seem larger. You have behind you this compact area, the entry where you came in. We, you could call it a foyer or something like that. But at the other end of the diagonal is the terrace that stretches out over the waterfall. So on the one side of the house, you have this great sense of, of shelter, and protection. At the other end, you have or refuge. The other end, you have almost danger and prospect. And those two competing and contrasting 
um, elements, I think, are, are one of the things that Wright was absolutely brilliant uh, in expressing because um, life is made richer by contrast. You're never as warm and comfy as you are curled up on the sofa with a blanket over you and a fire in the fireplace and it's snowing outside. Those are the, it just makes for richness of experience. So it's lo dark, light. Uh, likewise, you're, 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 seeing the, you're not seeing the waterfall when you first come to the house. You, you hear it, but you, you haven't seen it yet until you go out on that terrace. And then you're hung out in space in a, at a point where no human typically is ever located. A bird might be, but not a human. How did that feel when you saw that for the first time? I, this is extraordinary. I, I, I knew the other Frank Lloyd Wright house uh, nearby, Kentucky Knob, well, but Falling Water is just a tour de force. It's, um, it's a very, it, 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 there are elements that are very similar uh, in, the, in the Hagen house, but uh, Falling Water is, it, it's just such a big, big statement, a big expression, um, and it's all right. You know, it's at the Hagens. You have a, maybe a little more sense of the family's interests. Mrs. Hagen loved to cook, and you have that sense of it. But at Falling Water, it's all—it's Frank Lloyd Wright singing, is what it is. Frank Lloyd Wright has been described as a procrastinator, mm -hmm. and there's a story. I don't know if it's legend. I wanted to ask you about yeah. the design of Falling Water. It's been said that he designed Falling Water in just a few hours because the Kaufman family was coming basically to check up on him. Yeah, well, I, he was also very dramatic, Frank Lloyd Wright. He, he got the commission, he got the topographical, he came out to the site, the topographical uh, map was sent to him. And there is no doubt that during that nine months of gestation between from the time that he got the commission and he produced the first sketches, that he was thinking about it all the time. He had this, um, this incredible ability to conceptualize in his head you know I'm sure that he's in the evenings in his bedroom when he was not sleeping he was maybe doing a couple of sketches of things like that uh, of that nature but I think the story is true it was told by Edgar Taffel and Bob Mosher two apprentices who were there and Edgar was on our advisory committee here at Falling Water and he said that the phone call came in they had warned right that they were they would be coming and they were just touching base with him. We were in Chicago. We're heading to Milwaukee. Um, when they get to Milwaukee, they call and they say, we'll be there in probably a couple of hours. And Wright's eating breakfast. And he finishes his breakfast. Said, and he says, come on out, EJ. We're waiting for you. And the apprentices know that they haven't seen anything yet. And he sits down in the studio with the apprentices around him. And Taffel and Bob Mosier both said, all they could do was sharpen his pencils. He just drew it. The house is built over a waterfall, not looking at the waterfall. Can you tell me why that's important? As you can imagine, that was one of the first questions that the Kaufmans asked, right? Uh, because they had brought him to that, that site, one of their favorites, of course, at Bear Run. And they expected, as any of us would, that they would be able to see the, the waterfall from their picture window, say, in their living room. And Wright explained to them that... If you saw it all the time, it would be commonplace, almost like wallpaper for you. But that it should, you should still have to make an effort to go see the waterfall, It'll, to retain its sense of destination, which was a, something they always liked doing when they had a cabin here before, was walking down and seeing the waterfall. And I think that's a really valid point and something that I come to understand. But also, I think there's something else in Wright's mind about the whole thing. When you come to see the house, you you don't see it for the first. You don't see the waterfall immediately, and I think that's very important. It's not until you've experienced the whole house that you walk down there and and you see it. And what it is is your memory of falling water. It's 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 a much different feeling than what you had when you were walking through it, where where it's a fairly intimate house, very closely connected to nature, and then you see where you have been, and. That's what he leaves you with, is that memory of the house over the waterfall. How did the Kaufman family react when they saw the house? Oh, I think they loved it. You know, it was very brave of Edgar Kaufman Sr., I think, to go ahead with that 
project. It was a lot of people made fun of it. Um, there's a, a, a great cartoon that was produced by the uh, Engineers Society in Pittsburgh of falling water under construction, and it has lifeboats hanging off the side of the balconies and life preservers and things of that sort. Um, and it wasn't thought that it would stand. They thought it would collapse. To to put your sort of your reputation on the line, both Kaufman's and Wright's to go ahead with that project was a, took a very brave man. Can we talk about organic architecture now mm -hmm. and why it is so relevant today? Well, I think we've come to understand that nature is a really important part of all of our lives, or should be, and that by connecting people with the out of doors and with any, any element of nature, trees in, in the city come to see as, as very important to, to the quality of life in a city, that, that, that people react to it. And the fact that a home should be more than just housing, more than just shelter. Shelter should, it certainly should be shelter in the sense that it should feel as if you're being sheltered. But it, it, it is a place where, where you grow a child. And, and Wright certainly believed in all of those things. And that a house shouldn't be a cookie cutter. It should express the intentions and the thinking of the, of the clients and meet their needs at the same time. And the other last thing about organic architecture, and I think Falling Water uh, is, uh, epitomizes this, is that it doesn't have to be grand. It doesn't have to be marble and brass and gold fixtures to be really wonderful and to speak to you in a way uh, that is very strong. It doesn't have to be large. Falling Water is not a big house. Uh, over half the house is terraced or exterior space. So it's a house that uh, Mrs. Kaufman said, uh, after being there for a short time, said it was a study in elimination, that you didn't need all the stuff that we think we need, because there's no place to put it. <laughs> That's so true. I, I never noticed how much closet space there was in the house. <laughs> one of the things that my wife and I did, we, we visited Falling Water one time when we were just new homeowners. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I took away and she took away was, of all things, that that shade of red oh, yes. th that the house uses. And mm -hmm. we've lived in a couple of homes since we've been married in both times. It seems like we've we've integrated that shade of red into our own home. Yeah, and it, it, yeah. we can trace it right back to a visit here. here. But can you tell me about Falling Water? What features, even decorating, has been integrated into the American home? Yeah, I think it's eclecticism uh, is one thing. Um, so um, it, it's not... The Kaufmans, there's not one style, so it's not mid-century modern. It's um, a lot of things from all over the world, tribal things. It shows that you can mix styles and materials in a, in a way to make a, a, a space more comfortable. Other things, like you were talking about the Cherokee red, which is what Wright called that color, and it varied interestingly, depending on where the house was located. So when you see Cherokee, what he calls Cherokee red in, say, Arizona, it's much brighter than what it is here in a northern climate uh, like Falling Waters. But um, I think the use of uh, native materials, he was prescient in that he almost predicted some sustainability uh, issues at, at Falling Water and some of and his other buildings. Local materials, limited palette of materials. You know, there's only one color for the walls in Falling Water. It's all that ochre color, which Wright called an earthen material. I think not unlike the clay that was used by the Pueblo Indi Indians, which he would have um, seen while he was living in Arizona at the time. And stone laid up in this natural fashion. Uh, and the use of glass, all of that is ha has lasted, and, and we see in houses today. Uh, the one thing we don't see, which is surprising to me, but Wright always said it made his houses client-proof, <laughs> was built-in furniture. Uh, because you don't need a big space when you build in the furniture into the walls. It opens up the room. And uh, we could have much smaller houses uh, if we would just build in the furniture, and all you would be doing is reupholstering it periodically. It's surprising to me that more architects haven't adopted that. You've mentioned that falling water has no progeny. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that's so? Why do you think this house has not mm -hmm. been imitated to the extent that it's everywhere? Well, it's hard to imitate a house over a waterfall to begin that's with. That's a start. That, that's the beginning. Now, there has been a house, there's a, a, a house based on falling water in Africa, and uh, there are a few in other parts of the world. It's a very expensive house to build when you're building uh, cantilever construction on a hillside. But 
they feel like imitations of falling water, you know, and uh, every house should be unique. It, it, uh, I, it, I, I think some, uh, Paul Rudolph was a very famous American architect. He designed a house for the basses in Texas that has elements of falling water about it, but only from one vantage point. The rest of it, I don't think architects want to be copycats. They want to do their own projects. And this is a house that was a product of a by a special architect, a special client at a special place and a time. Uh, so I think I, I, I don't. There shouldn't be progenies. And and, and the other thing about right generally, I think, is um, what I had said before. His buildings are so site specific, so fitted to their clients that, unlike uh, Le Corbusier, whose buildings in the international style, it was a global architecture. He foresaw that there would be many, many Villa Sauvages all over the world, uh, replicas of it. Mies van der Rohe, too, which is just um, you know, very elegant, but very simple buildings that uh, could be easily copied. Wright's work is not easily copied. It, it just isn't. It, it is the work of genius. What is the message of falling water? If you had to sum it up, what would you say the message is of falling water? That man and architecture can exist in harmony with nature. And um, even though today we would never build on a site like that because we would want to protect it, this whole stream, which was a, an exceptional value stream, was protected because of falling water. And, and, and certainly people shouldn't be building in riparian zones like the, the edges of streams. But thank God at that time they could because it's, I think, a gift to everyone. And how did it change people's way of thinking? I think they thought well, they can, that, you know, Americans have always loved land. That's why we came here. We were seeking land and, and independence and uh, all of those things that owning your own property and your own home can provide. But I don't know that Falling Water changed our way of thinking necessarily. It changed the way we see the world, perhaps in that sense, you know, that we, we realize that modern architecture, which a lot of people don't feel, really feel very comfortable with, can be much more than a sterile box it can it can be something that is uh, constantly uh, showing different aspects of itself I think the one thing about falling water is that when you're in the house whatever hap- is happening outside the house is a very different house on a snowy day versus a rainy day versus a sunny day or in the fall and I think that's one of the reasons people keep coming back again and again at different seasons because it's a different experience Linda Wagoner thank you for being with us today thank you Make sure to check out our show notes for more information on everything that we talked about today. You'll find a complete bio on our guest, Linda Wagoner, and you'll get links to some great articles and information on the whole Falling Water story. And don't miss our next episode. Subscribe to the Shaping Opinion podcast in many ways, and they're all free and easy to find at iTunes and at shapingopinion.com. This is where we talk about the people, events, and things that have shaped the way we think. Until next time, I'm Tim O'Brien.